And it's Ken Kratzer for CBSI Services Talking Business. We're on Long Island today, have a chance to visit the campus of New York Institute of Technology and talk to their president, yep. who is Dr. Mm -hmm. Henry C. Hank Foley. And uh, Dr. Foley, good to visit you. You've got a beautiful campus out here. Thanks, Ken. Good to have you here. Well, that's, uh, it's neat to be here and talk a little bit about STEM education and technology education that your school is a leader in uh, through campuses in uh, New York and uh, New York City and also here in Old Westbury. Uh, tell us a little bit about the history of, of, of New York Institute sure. of Technology. Sure, I'd love to. It's, uh, the school's about the same age as I am, actually, or maybe I should say as we are. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it started in 1955 by a gentleman named Alexander Schur. And Alexander was both a, a PhD in engineering and also had a doctorate in education, a fascinating guy, and an entrepreneur on top of that. So he started the school because he recognized a need. Long Island was booming. There was a, a, a big aeronautical and aerospace industry that was forming in the 1950s. And he recognized that there weren't people who were trained to, uh, to really participate in it. So we started in the best of all possible ways, which is to fill a need, and we've continued to do that ever since. Well, very good. Now, tell us a little bit about uh, your uh, the path of your career in education. We are both fellow Providence College alumni, and uh, you went on to Purdue yeah. and Penn yeah. State, where you got your uh, your doctorate and, uh, and chancellor of University of Missouri Columbia. Tell us a little bit about the path of your career, if you would. Well, you know, it, it all went by pretty fast. I have to be honest with you. Uh, after I graduated from Providence, as you said, I went out to Purdue University. Uh, I was interested in Purdue because they they blend blended chemistry with electrical engineering and engineering. Uh, to build new instruments, and I found that fascinating. I got there and decided that physical chemistry was what I wanted to do. I liked math, and uh, the rest just sort of fell in place after that. I met my wife there, and uh, we got married in 1979 and then moved to Penn State when her two advisors moved from Purdue to Penn State. And I started with a gentleman named uh, Greg Joffrey, who uh, had just come out of Caltech and was pre-tenured, and full of energy, boundless energy, and it was great fun. And after I graduated from there, I went and worked at the University of Delaware as a postdoc, but in chemical engineering, again, moving further in that direction. And uh, then after that, we uh, went off to uh, Stanford, Connecticut, worked for a few years in industry, enjoyed that, and back to Delaware for 16 years, and then Penn State, 13 years, and Mizzou for almost four years, and here I am. Well, that's a terrific uh, career in education. I'm, I'm, kind of, I'm fascinated by that uh, you and I went to a liberal arts college that emphasized the study of Western civilization. Every student, you and I took that class for two years as undergraduates, but you uh, found a home in chemistry and in yep. technology. How did you make that leap? How did the liberal arts help you? Well, uh, the liberal arts were very challenging, to say the least, and having to uh, commute and be in class at 8 o'clock in the morning, five days a week, was no minor feat, especially for someone who's not a morning person, which I've never been. Uh, so the way it, it really helped me was that I had to learn how to learn very quickly, and I had to learn how to read quickly, because the reading assignments were enormous, as you recall. Writing was also a key part of it. Uh, but I really loved it. I thought it was a terrific course, and to this day, I think it's been a difference maker in my career in that uh, I'm able to talk to people who are not in the sciences or engineering, who are humanists, and I know a bit about what they're talking about, and I know a bit about their history and, uh, and what's important to them, I think, because of that course. Well, yeah, well, absolutely, uh, and, and I, I always say I wish I could take it over again now. Yeah, uh, yeah. It, I don't it, go that far. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's uh, terrific. You know, it's just when you actually when you get a chance to visit Europe and see some of the places they oh, were yeah. talking about, yeah. it really makes an impression on, on you. Now, you've done uh, just cover. Uh, you've had some interesting research areas. You've talked, to, you've studied, and written about nanotechnology, blockchain. Yeah. Yep. this whole new era of gaming uh, yep. technology. What have been some of the key areas of research uh, that you've uh, developed over your career? Yeah, so I stuck with one thing, actually, and that is I came out of American Cyanamid with a fascination uh, around carbon materials. And carbon materials were being used for structural materials for the first time. We now know they're routinely used as carbon fibers. 
And uh, that was fascinating. But at the same time, my area was uh, more involved with purification and also with generation of chemicals. So I was interested in carbons that were foam-like structures that had very small pores, uh, pores that, were, that had dimensions that are about the same size as small molecules. And because of that, you could really begin to do separations on the basis of size and shape. And that just fascinated me. So we spent a lot of time uh, working on that aspect of, of carbon materials, making them better, more robust, examining the basics of their structures, trying to understand why they had these regular pore structures when in fact they, uh, they had no crystallinity, so it wasn't obvious that they should be. Well, you just did one of the points that in, in our series of STEM education talks with different leaders in education. The consistent point has been being able to communicate technology, and you just did. Oh, thanks. Um, and, uh, and that liberal arts background can really help when you're trying to explain to a board of directors or to potential customers sure. what a project would be. Yeah. Why, why liberal arts would be developing good communicating and writing skills be important to people in technical STEM fields? Oh, it's absolutely essential. Uh, what, what you realize once you become a professor is that your main job is communication. Your main job in the classroom is to communicate. And as a researcher, uh, you have to communicate your ideas clearly, effectively, uh, with funding agencies, with your students, with your other colleagues, and so forth. So after a while, you realize, you know, I'm really more of a communicator than I ever realized it would be. It becomes an essential part of the job. And I think people who are better at it uh, do better at it. Absolutely. Now, let's, uh, let's have you... Uh talk about New York Institute of Technology. Uh, you've got a lot of engineering sure. programs. You've got medical programs. We went by the medical program yeah. building, driving yeah. into the campus today. Tell us, highlight some of the key programs here at New York Institute sure. of Technology. Sure. So first of all, we like to call it a polytechnic. That's an old-fashioned term, but it's everywhere. Worcester Polytech, Rensselaer Polytech, Virginia Polytech. People understand what that means. It's a European traditional model of an engineering school. But we're a polytechnic plus plus. And I say that because we've got so much more than the core polytechnic. We've got medicine, as you mentioned. We also have and offer advanced degrees in physical therapy, occupational therapy, physician's assistancy, uh, and like, as well as nursing. So we have much, much more than that. And one of the premier programs outside of medicine and, and uh, the medical arts and, and health professions is our architecture program which is sort of a blending of art, science, and engineering at a very high level. We have more licensed architects in the state of New York than any other school. Wow, with the New York uh, construction uh, economy booming, you see it in New York City, you see all the buildings like up by us in yeah. White Plains and, yeah. and, and apartments, so your, uh, your graduates must be busy on new construction. Uh, you know, I hate to use the word dominate, but they dominate the industry. Well, that's a, such an important field uh, uh, today. And uh, talking a little bit about STEM education and something I spent a lot of time with at the service academies, and uh, they're, they're looking for STEM majors for students and, and an industry. Um, we got to the Mid-Hudson Engineering uh, Expo last spring, where they had three gymnasiums full of students from uh, from the very young ones all the way to the high mm -hmm. schools and schools that were trying to attract them and some, some companies. Well, how do you feel that the, the field of STEM is attracting students right now? You know, I think it, it is attracting students, not as many as we would like to see going into the disciplines. One of the a great deal of the emphasis in STEM is always placed on uh, marketability of the student when they're finished. But what I'd like to emphasize is the way it changes the way you think. Right? So it becomes a disciplined way of thinking uh, that I think can be used almost in any capacity after you learn how to think this way. And that's why you find engineers who, if they have people skills and communication skills, really could go anywhere and do anything. In fact, most engineers only do engineering for about five years of their career. Well, we um, have seen, actually, one of the things we've seen is kind of the bridging of engineering and business schools. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. Harvard has a new program, Carnegie Mellon has a program now. Why is it a, a good possibility to blend engineering and business education? So I think engineering gives you a systems uh, view of the world. So you really are able to analyze uh, 
different kinds of systems with the same general methodology. And business enterprises are systems. They're complex systems. And engineers have an, an aptitude for analyzing and understanding them, and then understanding how to make them grow, and how to make them better. So I think it's that simple. I think the two blend beautifully. Well, certainly a trend. Now, we have a common uh, friend, a Providence grad uh, from the early 1960s, Art Ryan, who uh, uh, his name and his, that of his late wife is on the business school building, a beautiful yeah. building yes. just opened a couple of years ago. And Art was a senior leader at Chase when I worked there in the 80s, and then he be, went on to become the CEO of Prudential. And he made a kind of a reputation uh, by learning to upgrade the computer systems at Chase or managing yeah. all the statements for checking accounts and credit cards. And he said in a talk he learned some of that in the Army yeah. and advanced. But when you, when you see senior leaders of organizations that are very data intensive, what are some of the, the, the kind of engineering skills they need, data management skills they need to know as we're in this world of managing huge amounts of customer data? Well, I, I think first of all, there's an aptitude for numbers that is crucial for data analysis, uh, an aptitude for being able to work with numbers, to work with statistical methods, but also to just look for trends and trend lines. Uh, that's something that I think people with engineering backgrounds or scientific backgrounds tend to do pretty well. So they're able to pick up patterns well. And those patterns then often, right, are first indicators of change. And those who can pick up the first indicators of change early are usually the winners. And can act on them, sure. Now, in banking, uh, my first job uh, was when I first saw a desktop computer. It was an yeah. Apple that uh, yeah. my first uh, boss, uh, Herb Dunhill, had. We were in the mailing list business. And, uh, and look at all the technology that has entered into our careers from uh, email, uh, yeah. to, uh, to uh, desktop computers, uh, spreadsheets, Microsoft Office, what a change that was. Oh my gosh. And yeah. Google, and, uh, and now, and cell phones. I always say barcodes made a big difference. Yeah, yeah. And, and now smartphones have revolutionized RFID. communication. So many things. What have been some of the big changes in technology that you've seen and that students uh, now are, are benefiting from? Well, clear cut, computing. No question about it. So if you see the first transistor, uh, it was made just after World War II, I think at Bell Laboratories. It's about this big, right? And it's a chunk of germanium, which has been doped. It's a triangular chunk and has wires coming out of it that look like paper clips. Everything that we do today is based on that technology. So it's astonishing, absolutely astonishing how it's changed everything. And on top of that then, you also have programming languages and, and the like, which have advanced further and further. So people are using things like Python now and the like, which are very easy to learn, very adaptable languages, quite different than what we had in the 1980s, uh, and, and really much more uh, versatile languages. So it's a combination of both the hardware and the software going forward faster and faster, and creative people finding new ways to adapt solutions for other problems to new problems. So it's an evolutionary trend. Oh, sure. And uh, we see management of data is huge, uh, certainly in the banking banks that we work with and the credit card business sure. where there are hundreds yeah. of millions of customers being served. But what's interesting right. is ahead. the same management of data there is how we do management of data in bioinformatics, for example, right? So data is data. And what you're looking for are trends or interesting aspects of the data and, and so people find some new technology or techniques in one area, and that gets quickly applied into new areas that were unanticipated. Now I'm gonna ask you to do a 30 second rundown on, what you, on the term you just used, bio? Bioinformatics. Bioinformatics, that's a new one, tell okay. us about that. Well, so the other great discovery in our lifetimes uh, really was the structure of DNA, right? And with the structure of DNA, we realize all the coding for life is in these strands of DNA, these strands of amino acids. So in order to understand what the codes mean, you really have to break down the sequences. And when you break down the sequences, you start to realize that certain chunks are genes and that those genes are there essentially to catalyze the formation of certain proteins. 
And then on top of that, those proteins have primary, secondary, tertiary structure, which is shape, which really controls or controls what they do inside the body biophysiologically. So all of these things are information-driven sciences now. When I took biology for the first time, it was still a very descriptive science, right? Not anymore. Now it's very mathematical, very computational, and very different than it was because of the revolution in, in sequencing. Well, that's, uh, that's, uh, I appreciate that, uh, that description. Now, uh, we work uh, obviously with uh, uh, large organizations and, and you have students that are going out into, uh, say, banking or financial services yes. and yeah. uh, data privacy is a huge issue sure uh, today, is. yeah. uh, uh, giving customers choice on how data is used. What are some of the keys you work with students on who might go into the field of uh, data management? So cybersecurity is one of our most popular programs. Uh, particularly at the master's level. So students who've gotten some uh, education perhaps in computer science or maybe they've been educated uh, in, as undergrads in uh, information technology can then go to the next stage, get a master's degree and become experts in securitizing all of that data and information. And it's a never ending battle. And I hate to say the word battle, but it is. It's a battle between those people who are trying to get the data and those people who are trying to protect it. Well, we were just at a conference in Washington, D.C. with a gentleman named Adam Levin uh, from CyberScout gave a talk on making just that point that it's a never-ending battle and, uh, and, and a real challenge. Uh, you've written about blockchain. Some people point to blockchain as a way of adding another level of security. Yes. Uh, what, do you see, what do students uh, think and professors, the think about the solution is for uh, greater security and data management? Uh, there is no one solution. Blockchain has the potential uh, to be a solution for certain kinds of transactions, banking in particular, but it, again it may have applications outside of banking uh, because you have parallel authorization of transactions that have occurred and it doesn't that the uh, record keeping of all of those transactions and their authorizations is distributed. So it's not in one place where you could crack it. But there are ways to crack blockchain too. So there, it will, it, it's evolution and it, it's a pressurized evolution because there are dr strong drivers for the bad guys to want to get better at what they do, meaning that we have to be better all the time and alert to what they're doing uh, to keep business safe. Absolutely. Huge problem. You mentioned uh, the uh, aeronautical engineering yep. business and industry on Long Island, uh, I guess you could say led by Grumman during, yes. its, uh, yep. during its big days uh, with uh, the Navy and then also with uh, the space program. I had an uncle who worked for yep. Grumman in the, in the 1960s during that period. Yep. Uh, we, just, uh, we just celebrated the 50th anniversary of the moon landing. Right. And we were at the American Museum of Natural History for their summer, uh, commemoration. And what struck me was how much technology increased in about the 100 years from when electricity started to be yes. handled in the 1870s to putting a man on the moon in the 18, you know, 1969. How did all that happen in, in your, uh, your mind? Yeah, well, uh, a lot of very creative people, uh, Tesla, Edison, uh, then others that we don't know as, as much about but who were also incredibly critical. I think it all moved very quickly with the vacuum tube and the concept of the vacuum tube and what it did. It's basically a big transistor, uh, but it, it was what we had as a switching device prior to transistors. Uh, you and I probably still remember TV sets yes. that had vacuum tubes in them. Black and white, yeah. yeah. And when one vacuum tube burned out, you had to take them all out, go to the store, and test each individual vacuum tube until you found the one that worked. They generated enormous amounts of heat. They were big, they were clumsy. Uh, the advent of the integrated circuit changed everything. But you make a great point, and that is really before all of that, you had to have electricity and electric infrastructure. I've never really thought about it that way before, but that was probably the most important initial breakthrough was the electrification of society. I'm sure there's been a lot of discussion about the two originators and the two variations that, uh, that were initially yeah. founded for electricity. And 
Uh, just, uh, I guess I thought you've written a, a lot about the human side of technology and you have a medical program here. And we were discussing earlier, uh, I thought I, I go back to often from high school, from Alvin Toffler, oh, yeah. his book, sure. Future, Shock. Future Shock. And he, he talked about the innovations of the 1960s and 70s. And he said, you got to be high tech, high touch. Yeah. You know, if you're going to apply, I think of this in medicine all the time. Yeah. If you're going to apply a high tech solution of equipment or a procedure, you got to be very personal about it. Yeah. Uh, how do you do that here at uh, NYT? So our medical school in particular, I think, does a great job of that, of blending what I would call the humanity uh, of the art of medicine with the science of medicine. And they're very purposeful about it. So there are courses that deal with it. And actually, because they're osteopathic physicians, they actually believe that touch is a critical part, literally a critical part of what they do. Sure. Yeah. Well, I'd just like to uh, maybe finish up by um, asking again to uh, maybe suggest why students should consider uh, New York Institute of Technology. I know you're rebranding re to New York Tech, which I think is a terrific uh, direction. Um, but what, why should uh, students consider your school? Oh, well, uh, lots of reasons. Number one, we're a highly diverse school, right? So our student population is very diverse, and that's good. That's a powerful thing. Number two, we're seventh in the nation among schools of our kind in moving students up from the bottom 20% of the economic strata to the top 20%. That's really amazing. Sure. So that's something that we really hang our hats on. Number three, 95% of our students who graduate get good jobs or go to graduate school within six months. That's, again, another very commendable statistic. And most recently, because of all of this, because we're talking more about ourselves, we moved up 130 places in the rankings nationally. So we're really on the move, and it's a great blending of technology, science, uh, and general education that I think sets people up for success. Well, that's why you should come here. Okay, well, you can see it, and uh, uh, your website has uh, uh, some great descriptions of the program. Final question is just, uh, we're both uh, from Providence College. Uh, in fact, we'll be up there Friday uh, for their homecoming. and. Uh, Tell us, what, is there a key thing that you learned at Providence from your, your years there from the Dominicans and the professors there that uh, has helped you along the way? Yeah, uh, it was a saying that the Dominicans coined probably in 1200 and is uh, never deny, seldom affirm, always question. Okay, <laughs> that's a very good, good thought. Hey, I really want to thank you, uh, Dr. Hank Foley, president of New York Institute of Technology, Providence College grad, and uh, Really appreciate uh, your you, uh, insight. My pleasure. Good to see Great you. Great to be with you today. Great to visit. We appreciate it. Thank you. And for CBSI Services Talking Business, today at uh, the campus of New York Institute of Technology on Long Island, this is Ken Kreitzer.